so we are here with um, Dr. Zamora, the new superintendent for, Tom uh, for Tomball Independent School District. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Good morning. Of course. Good morning. So what brought you to Tomball initially? Oh, gosh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I was fortunate enough to move back with my family, my husband and, and daughters, to the, the area uh, three years ago. And I applied for a position here as chief academic officer and was very fortunate to be selected. And I will tell you, from the first time I started to now, I knew I had found a place I wanted to stay. Well, we're glad you did. Thank you. <laughs> um, so a lot of people have been asking what your priority will be as superintendent. Right. Um, so there will be a number of priorities. I will tell you probably the greatest one is continuing with what we call our strategic plan. And so the district came together with school board members, with teachers, with community members, with uh, parents, of course, and staff, and we worked on a three to five year, pretty much a five year strategic plan. And in that, we included many, many things that we want to see happen in the Tomball School District to continue to be a district of innovation. And so I would say there are many areas that I will focus on as far as priority, but that would be the overarching one because it includes so much of what, the work that we want. I want to continue doing as superintendent. Is the Tomball Star Academy included in that five-year kind of plan? So not directly, but indirectly, because uh -huh. in that we talked about new innovative uh, opportunities for students, and so Tomball Star Academy is going to be an early college high school, which means that the ISD, Tomball, will partner with Lone Star College for an opportunity for students to, by application, be admitted to a program that would allow them, after four years, to leave with an Associate of Arts degree, which is a, an amazing savings, not only time, but money, to the students and families of Tomball. How many students do you expect to be in that program? So we wrote the Memorandum of Understanding, our actual binding agreement, with Lone Star to have approximately 125 per class, so the school overall will cap at 500. Primarily the courses the first two years, freshman and sophomore year will be here on the second floor of Tomball High School and then the last two years they will take uh, many of their courses at Lone Star College. Wow, what an opportunity. It, it's an exciting opportunity for students who find that to be what they want. Um, some students really, really, really want to continue with band or UIL, football, cheer, theater, and that's wonderful. We love to have those opportunities for students like yourselves, but there are some students that do things outside of school through club sports or other type of activities, and this is something that they want to connect with. I can tell you from the initial interviews, we're very excited about the incoming freshman class because we can feel their energy and we know that they really are excited about building a culture and a climate right here upstairs. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, so what are some of um, Tomball ISD's uh, strengths as well as their weaknesses and areas of improvement? Okay, so there are many strengths and I'll start with that. Um, the strengths really, I would think the greatest strength of this district in this community is really the community itself. And what I mean by that is I've had the opportunity to work in many districts mm -hmm. uh, from the largest in our state, Houston ISD as an assistant superintendent, to perhaps my superintendency in a smaller district, which was my hometown of Kingsville, Texas, down by Corpus Christi. And so knowing small, knowing midsize, knowing very, very large urban, the beauty of Tomball as a community is that it really does, in a way, kind of wrap its arms around the district and the students and faculty. We are a, I consider us a smaller community with a really big heart. Mm -hmm. And we take care of one another, we know each other. Um, no, not everybody, but somebody knows somebody. And that close, that connectedness is so important. We, I feel a sense of family within the district that spills into the community. And that is not apparent in every district. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful thing when that can happen. Awesome. So what would you say are some of the weaknesses? weaknesses. Okay, so, right, so I wouldn't call this a weakness, uh -huh. but I would call it a potential concern. Okay. Um, with growth, that can change. And so 99 is uh, Grand Parkway is wonderful and that's bringing a lot of new opportunities to our area and additional families which we love you know to have new people into the district but we have to be careful that we don't lose 
our identity and the culture that I just described as we grow quicker and quicker because we have grown quite a bit we are considered a fast growth district mm -hmm. and so with that can come areas of concern and I don't see that and I will keep um, aware of that during my superintendency and so that is that is a potential area but I wouldn't call it a weakness and I don't think it will become one we're just going to be watchful <laughs> Good to know. Um, so a lot of I guess parents have been talking about the possibility of a new high school being built can you confirm deny? so what I can tell you is as a matter of fact last night we had a, a workshop a special workshop with the we had a board meeting uh -huh. uh, our actual board meeting is tonight but it was the um, agenda review is what it's called so it's a pre-meeting in other words but after that we held a workshop to talk about uh, potential future bonds and the need because I just mentioned growth so what I will tell you is as a need there's always just like at home you might have what you need and what you want in the school district we have the same thing we know we need a new elementary because of growth we know we need a new junior high same reason and we know we're going to need to add on to Tomball Memorial High School because of growth on that side of our community um, currently that's where we are now in the future time will tell but those are our immediate needs for growth okay um, do you have so how are you going to work with the teachers in like because there's such an like influx of students coming into the schools how are you going to work with them to maximize learning okay so we have a lot of ways in which we maximize learning. Probably the best one is through professional learning themselves. So teachers just like you, um, this Friday is an example, they will have a full day of professional learning. So if it's an area that they have to have additional hours in, like a gifted and talented teacher or a special education teacher, we provide that. Or if it's just something that they would like to become stronger in, like classroom management or how to teach a particular core subject area. Um, so teachers really never stop learning. Um, Krista McCulloch, the, the educator who went into um, space many years ago, um, and in her ill-fated Challenger mission before that said, I touch the future, I teach. And if you think about that, teachers really are the profession that make all other professions possible. And so you know, Sam, you and I spoke a little bit about what you want to do after you graduate and you have one more year before you make mm -hmm. that decision. But truly, teachers have shaped your parents, your community, many people have had a hand in that. Teachers um, are with you sometimes longer than even your parents when you think about the length of a school day. So it's important that we continue to provide professional learning for our teachers who are already very strong or teachers who need additional assistance. We may have a new teacher who's just started who doesn't have all the years of experience that she, over time where we become, um, I think, stronger at our craft of education. So some of the schools in the surrounding areas, um, junior highs or elementary schools, um, have adopted a study hall period. Mm -hmm. Well, do you see that being implemented in the high school or just staying kind of in the younger grades? So that's a great opportunity for students that need to um, be organized and prioritize learning. Um, we really are, there are two different types of, of thoughts in education, centralized versus decentralized. What does that mean? Central office gives a lot of autonomy and, and really freedom to the campus instructor, the, the campus leader, which would be your principal, your instructional principal. Um, and so Mr. Quinn and his team, uh, Ms. McKinney and the other uh, assistant principals, make that decision with their site-based team and so the central office would not be against that uh, if that's something that they decided you know we really have some students that would benefit from this um, they would have to structure the day to allow that because we wouldn't add additional minutes to your day or to the teacher's day to provide that but we are in a in that case decentralized district where the decisions aren't made at central office and teachers and principals have to live with those decisions it's a case of the campus is deciding what's best for us, what's best for our students, and how can our staff best support our students. Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, how did the implementation of Secretary of Education Betsy DeFoss affect you and Tom Wall in the school district? Okay. Does it yeah. So we, it will. I believe it will. And um, I'm an optimist, and so mm -hmm. I'm always going to stay optimistic. You know, obviously, I've seen the media, and I'm I'm on Twitter as well, and. Um, any other social outlet. What I will tell you is we're going to be watchful. There is a bit of concern that some of the dollars uh, may be taken from public education. Mm -hmm. 
probably not from special education, my assumption, probably more from what we consider to be title dollars, title funds for campuses that are identified and currently serving some families that are low socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a concern to me because we really do depend on our title dollars for, for campuses that need specific uh, materials or additional staff development as I mentioned or just the dollars to provide to our students and so I'm going to continue to stay optimistic and be watchful and voice when I need to the opportunity to say this is what we need for public education students I believe that all parents have the right and should choose whatever is right for their children if that's a parochial school that's beautiful for that family if that's a private school if that's uh, a magnet school or charter school. I'm not, I'm not against education in any way. As a public school administrator, soon to be superintendent of a public school district again, it's imperative to me though that the dollars that we can keep stay with our public schools. That is what concerns me with what I'm hearing. And again, we'll see what happens as this unveils and we'll just be hopeful and support her. She doesn't have a, a lot of knowledge in public education right. and so I think she will need people who understand it, who love it, mm -hmm. who believe in it to help her see what we want to continue to provide and why we need those dollars to provide that. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Um, well one of the things that it says here is like we've had a lot of problems at the, this school specifically mm -hmm. um, with like divisions between certain groups of students and some students may not feel specifically safe like at school mm -hmm. and people some like our staff wanted to know how you can make some of the students here feel safer at school okay so that's a very important question whether you're in a school or out in our community safety is a priority and it has to be a priority so we need to make sure that the staff feel safe but most importantly that the students come to school every day and feel safe as well. Now there's a difference. You all have a voice and having a voice is important and that you will always have that voice. It's knowing when you can practice that or should practice that to what extent and being cautious that you are not, to put it plainly, hurting the voice of another individual and so that we don't have um, that uh, rift between students within and we can accept each other's differences and and really celebrate those and look at it from the lens of diversity being a beautiful thing but not being from the lens of something that has to divide diversity should never divide but students should have a voice but we need to have a way in which that can be shared and understood because sometimes something can be said and it's misunderstood and that was not the intention and so at the very premise of your question is safety. So student safety from an outsider coming in or students with, from within is going to always be imperative at any level. And then going along with that, you, I'm sure you know about the lawsuit against the district and some of the people at our school because of um, cyberbullying and bullying concerning one of the girls here. And um, I just wanted to know how are you going to be enforcing these cyberbullying prevention? So I won't actually um, direct the comment to the any any type of legalities because it, there could continue to be legalities at this point. But let's talk about the premise of cyberbullying. Okay, so I have a phone. If I asked you, you probably both have phones as well. Uh, there are very few students here that are not somehow connected to some form of technology. I believe that we're connected. Students are connected 24/7 except when we're sleeping perhaps, right? And hopefully, I don't know, occasionally I know teenagers that probably even text in the middle of the night. <laughs> but I won't ask if that's you. But we really need to be cautious because cyberbullying as a device can be a tool to help us learn, to help us grow, to keep us informed, to celebrate it, uh, events. I can tell you countless celebrations of, of congratulatory um, messages sent to me on my de device for my recent um, loan finalist appointment. So there are, there's a lot of good, but there can be bad as well. We have to be very careful that all students understand that we don't want any student to be hurt or to be bullied or to even feel that, that their rights have been infringed upon either verbally in person or using a device or some form of technology. I think that we've become very free with what we share as 
not just as individuals, not just students, adults as well. Um, and we have to continue to be mindful about that because if anything we're putting out there is in any way, shape, form, or fashion hurting another individual, then it really should not occur. Just remembering kindness, you know, choosing kindness. All right. Well, I guess to wrap up, what is your favorite thing about Tomball and Tomball ISD? Oh, gosh. I would have to say the kids. I would have to say you guys. I love, I mean, I love whether I'm in a, a kindergarten class or middle school where they're not really in our junior high age where they're not really sure they're not little, maybe intermediate too, where they're like, I just left elementary, but I'm not quite, I'm looking for secondary. Or confident young ladies that are sophomores and juniors ready to go out and conquer the great world. I, I do what I do because of you guys. <laughs>